Well, we've seen the pictures, David, and here we have the real thing. It strikes me that there's a lot of different types of curling stone. Well, what I've tried to do here is show the history of the, of the stones from these 17th century ones through 18th century, these three here, uh, into the 19th century when circularity uh, became the norm. This kind of thing then would just be gripped with the hand, would it? It was gripped in the loof or the palm of the hand. And, but as you can see, um, the stone has been dressed to quite a considerable extent um, so that it ran well, so you got a good grip for the fingers and on the other side a grip for the thumb. It must have been a big gorilla though who threw that one because uh, <laughs> I find it very difficult to hold comfortably. And the next stage up would be something like this, would it? Yes, as you can see that's very much a boulder uh, with, uh, with a minimum of, of, of Mason's dressing on it to give it a, a less crude shape. And a very crude handle too, that kind of Well, uh, the handle would have been a bit more sophisticated. That one came out of a building site in, in Ayr a number of years ago. Um, beside a, uh, the buildings were being put up beside a place called Dam Side, which suggests that there was curling in the 18th century. But as you can see from the one beside it, um, they weren't worried about the triangularity of, um, of stones. It was a game really of brute strength in these days, and it wasn't until the stones became circular and therefore rebounded off each other at predictable angles that a more sophisticated game that we play at the present day uh, evolved. So what, these will be about, what, 1500? No, like I think these are probably 17th century century. This one has the date 1699 upon it. Again, it's the Luffy. I'm a bit dubious about dates carved on stones, particularly <laughs> the very old ones. And, and what year about would these? I would think these are late 18th century, these three. And when then did the, the kind of the modern looking curling stones start to come in? Well, this one is a modern looking curling stone. It has the initials GD on it in very elegant um, script. And I know where the stone came from, and therefore I know that the GD was George Dunbar, who was the professor of Greek at the University of Edinburgh, and he joined the Duddingston Curling Society, probably with this stone in the year 1810. A similar age um, can be attributed to this stone because it was the initials JP, that was uh, James Patterson, who farmed Carmacaupa Farm in Douglas Parish in Lanarkshire, um, and uh, it was one of his successors in the farm who gave me that uh, stone a number of years ago. And it's made from red stone, which used to be the road, the road metal in that part of Lanarkshire. And they've come from different quarries then, because lots of people think that killing stones just come from Elsa Craig and nowhere else. Well, on the table here, there are only one. There are only two stones that come from Ailsa Craig. In the earlier days, before stones were produced commercially in factories, um, folk got hard igneous rock wherever they could from the beds of rivers, from boulders and fields. Um, uh, some were quarried. The black one there with the silver looped handle uh, was a kind of stone called Crawford John, which was very highly prized in the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. It took a very high polish. You can see it's got big crystals in it and that makes it not a very good uh, stone for taking the sear dunts, the hard knocks uh, that curling stones uh, have to take. And the disadvantage of that, despite its great beauty, was that uh, in a very hard frost they were inclined to break on contact. <laughs> and then, um is there a kind of a standard size now, a standard weight for the curling stone? Well, as you can see, there was never a standard in the past. And curiously enough, the rules don't provide for a standard now. They provide a, for a maximum height, a maximum circumference, and a maximum weight. So within these parameters, there isn't room for a great deal of variation. But the rule now provides that a curling stone, including handle, cannot weigh any more than 44 pounds. Some of them like that big one there, um, uh, weighed about 70 pounds in the past. And there are stones that are much, much heavier than that. How anyone threw them is beyond my <laughs> comprehension. And, and the stones are great. I mean, they're, they're just sort of lovely shape, they're, they're nice and smooth, but the handles as well, of course, they, they can be everything from the crude to the really ornate. 
Yes. Well, this one is nice. This shows um, uh, this shows a bit of artistic imagination because what we have is a pair of oak leaves and a bit of oak branch um, uh, to, f to form a curling stone. Sorry, can we ask that question again, please? Because we're just on a totally different shot at the moment. All right. So we'll just oh. adjust the shot. <laughs> okay. Oh, do you want a cat in? That's okay. <laughs> and the stones themselves, fantastic, lovely round shapes, very tactile, lovely to touch, but the handles as well can range, it seems to me, from the, the crude, the incredibly ornate over there. Yes, well this one is nice, this is a, I think a late 19th century handle, you can see that a bit of artistic thought has gone into it, um, it's, the, it's formed of two oak leaves and a bit of oak branch here, um, and the person who uh, designed a pair of curling stones like that obviously was expressing his tremendous interest in the game. This pair here um, are of a form uh, which is earlier, these date from 1864. Uh, sorry, they were. Just hold you there. Could you just do that one? Just one second for us because we're just. We're, we're chasing you around. Okay. You want me just to begin again? No, yes. No, 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 it's just that one. Yes. Okay. Uh, this handle, for instance, is of an earlier period. It's, it's, uh, I've dated it by uh, dint of a lot of research to 1864 because the inscription has been um, meticulously polished off by a series of lady owners. Um, <laughs> I, but it represents almost the acme of the silversmith's art because the handle is brass and it's not silver plated. It has a sort of silver sleeve, carefully made and soldered together. Um, and then you'll see that on every second surface there is an, an individual uh, engraving of thistles. The thistle was the great um, emblem of the curlers because it is the emblem of Scotland and because curling was regarded as Scotland's own game, um, the thistle is, of, is often associated with it. In other cases, folk went to tremendous lengths to decorate the stones themselves. The stone in the middle here without the handle, which I've chalked to bring up the pattern, has the most elegant floral uh, decoration on the top surface and then stylized foliage and um, scallops uh, down below. Um, stones like that didn't come cheap and again they represent the tremendous regard in which the game was held by its participants. Well, we've seen the pictures, David, and here we have the real thing in front of us, the curling stones. It strikes me that there's a lot of different kinds. Well, what we have here is a historical progression of stones from the earliest sort, which were without handles, the so-called loofies, because they were held in the loof, or the palm of the hand. They had a, a groove for the fingers, a depression for the thumb, and they were thrown like coits um, across the ice. This is a bigger brute. As you can see, the stonemason has gone to great trouble to make that fit his massive hand. Big as I am, I can't hold this comfortably, but he's dressed out the circumference so that it fitted his hand. These are 17th century stones. Is this the next kind of progression up from there then? The next stage was the boulder to which a handle was affixed, or the boulder with a minimal amount of mason's dressing, and that's what that one is. Could we turn that one round and could you put it on its back? You'll see that the sole or running surface of the stone is exceedingly smooth, although the stone itself is very, very coarse, and that the mason has dressed up the front edge uh, so that when, he, when the man threw it onto the ice, it, it didn't catch the ice and get damaged. What happened there then? Uh, it must have been a sere dunt, as we say, a, a severe blow from another curling stone at some point. But everyone now thinks of curling stones as being circular, but the next one along is a triangular stone from Perthshire. And um, until well into the 18th century, um, triangular stones were favoured by some people because if you had a triangular stone sitting in the target area in the house, 
Um, only a direct hit could move it. Otherwise, it just birled round, as we say, or whirled round on the spot. So those are kind of any shape, any size almost. Then we start to get towards the traditional, as we know, the modern curling stone. Yes. Well, the big one at the end there um, shows a considerable size. It's at nearly 70 pounds in weight. Um, again, although the stone was circular and therefore the, uh, potentially uh, productive of a more scientific game. Do you like to do that one again? I'll just... Um... <sighs> <coughs> Excuse me, just a minute. <coughs> yes. I quite like that little zoom in into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, off you go. So from the earlier kind of crude examples, we're starting to get towards the more modern looking curling stone up there, are we? Yes. These three that we've been talking about date from the end of the 18th century. This big brute at the end here, which weighs about 70 pounds, although circular, is still quite is still quite crude, and it would need a lot of strength to throw a stone uh, that size. Um, the, de the next development uh, was a reduction in the size and weight of the stones, and you can see examples of them um, at different periods of the evolution of the game uh, on the table. Where do we want to go now? Yeah, that was good, that was good. I like that one. Uh, okay. Right, um, we went to the silver, didn't we? We went to the silver. We went to the silver well, we took... I was good. Okay. Yes. And some of the stones are decorated quite nicely with, with patterns, and others have um, initials and inscriptions on them. Now, would that help you date and find the owner of these things? Oh, without a doubt. I know where this stone came from. It came from Duddingston now part of Edinburgh. Um, the initials are GD, the minutes of the Duddingston Curling Society survive, um, and this in fact belonged to George Dunbar, who joined the club in 1810 when he was Professor of Greek at the University of Edinburgh. Incidentally, the principal of the university, the Reverend Dr George Baird, was a, was a president of the Duddingston Curling Society um, at that time. So this was a game played by everybody? It was a game played by all classes of society. And what about that really nicely decorated stone over there? That was dug up from somebody's garden in Penpunt. And when I was talking to the man on the phone, he said, I've got a curling stone with flowers on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really pretty one, the one without the handle there. That is the uh, most decorated curling stone that I've yet come across. It was dug up in a man's garden in Pinpunt in Dumfrieshire. And when I was speaking to him on the phone, they said, um, I've got a curling stone with flowers on it. And I didn't believe him. Uh, but there it is. Sadly, because it's been in the open, um, the decoration isn't just as, quite as clear as it was. And that's why I've chopped the top surface so that the two wreaths of flowers, elegant flowers, coming from the elegant Georgian bow um, are clearly visible. And there's more decoration on the shoulders, scallops and stylized foliage. Uh, sorry. Carry on. <laughs> and the stones themselves are just fantastic, the shape and, and, and the smoothness. They're just, they're just asking to be touched, aren't they? But the handles also, they, they range from the early crude handles to some quite ornate things that you've got here. Things. Handles type things. Shall I do that again? <laughs> Yes, we'll start on the, that one far left, which is going to... No, yes. that's it. <laughs> and if the stones themselves are <coughs> fantastic and they just... <laughs> and are you coming to that one? Yes. yes. We're going to so go from there. there. We're coming through. There. Yes. Do you, do you want to stop off with Ali? Sorry, I've got bloody nose. <laughs> 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 okay, here we go. Stand by. Uh, and just as the stones themselves seem to progress from crude lumps of rock to highly polished, beautiful objects, the handles seem to have undergone a similar change from the crude kind of uh, metal just stuck in the top of the stone to some really ornate examples. Yes, that one has got bent in the course of history. It wouldn't have been that shape originally. Um, but you, you can see a wooden handle here. Uh, wood was fairly common at one stage. Um, the Iron permanently fixed to the top was the next stage, and then removable handles 
This handle removes by virtue of these screws there, uh, and it is a, a, an absolutely wonderful yeah, handle. Stop there, and as the stones themselves seem to progress from crude rumps, <laughs> rumps of lock, <laughs> <coughs> And as the stones themselves seem to progress from crude lumps of rock to highly polished examples, the handles seem to have gone, to gone a, a similar metamorphosis from these crude examples to some highly polished, highly designed, highly... What the hell am I saying here? Uh, from this one here. Yes, that one is, looks cruder than it was because it's got bent in the course of um, history. This one is interesting because it's a very rare survival of what was common, namely a wooden handle. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Am I ready? Yeah. And the stones have undergone a transformation, haven't they, from crude lumps of rock to highly polished, beautiful examples, and the handles seem to have gone the same way, from pretty ordinary handles to some highly decorated ones. Yes, that one has got bent and damaged in the course of history. It wouldn't have been as crude looking um, originally. Um, this one over here with the wooden handle is a very rare survival because, um, uh, well, wood for obvious reasons, it doesn't survive. It burns and... Uh, Woodworm love it. Um, but that was a common form of handle. Uh, here we have, uh, on a beautiful stone, um, a really, really elegant handle that really is an example of the acme of the silversmith's um, art because the basis of the handle is cast brass. It's not silver plated. It's covered in a sort of very elegantly and cleverly made sleeve um, of silver and every second surface um, is individually engraved with thistles, um, the thistle being the emblem of Scotland and curling being Scotland's own game, Scotland's own game. Uh, the two are often depicted together. When we come into maybe the beginning of uh, this century, um, we have odd examples of really special handles. The man who had these ones commissioned out of two oak leaves and a bit of oak branch um, obviously thought a lot about the game uh, and was prepared to uh, pay for what I'm sure you'll agree is a very elegantly elegant design of handle. That's brilliant.
and it never fails to amaze me, you know, you've got the, the main collection and then you have the associated knickknacks like this, look. The curling equivalent of the egg warmer. Here we have the inkwell. This, believe it or not, is a muffin warmer, a must for every household. Now this is a pot for things like money off vouchers, stamps, blue tack and paper clips. And we finish with a good old fashioned cup of tea. Okay, here we go, stand by, just take your, that's it, okay, here we go, and action. It never fails to amaze me, you know, you've got the main collection and then you have the associated knickknacks. For instance, you have the curling equivalent of the egg warmer. For instance, you have the uh, curling equivalent of the egg warmer there. Here we have the inkwell. This is a must for every household, the muffin warmer. Where would you be without that? This is a, a pot for ordinary everyday objects, things like sh shopping vouchers, uh, paper clips, blue tack and stamps. And you can finish off with a good old fashioned cup of tea. So a, a close look at the handles, uh, David. We'll start with possibly the most uh, rudimentary of the collection here. Yes, this one, as you can see, has just been knocked up by uh, the local blacksmith. And I suppose that was what happened in the in earlier period. There can't have been much of a living to be made out of making curling stone handles. <laughs> but they are, again, very elaborate, some of these, aren't they? Well, this one's nice. This is a big, heavy thing. It weighs about three pounds. It's been cast in one piece. It's a very elegant um, piece of design. And the person who commissioned these, again, obviously uh, thought a lot of the game and uh, thought it was worthwhile paying over the odds, I presume, for a handle like that. Just inlaid with wood, is that? That's wood to uh, cushion the hand, I suppose, against the extreme cold. And this? This one, uh, this was a, pri a pair of prize handles uh, that were won in 1872 and you can see the decoration, they're brass, silver plated with thistles all over them, um, again proclaiming the Scottishness of the game of curling. Um, but it shows that jewellers were beginning to uh, take an interest in uh, producing that sort of thing. And was there a reason why these things were detachable from the actual stone? Ha <laughs> ha! There were two reasons, but one of the good ones was, and the earliest one was, that uh, when you left the stones behind in the curling house where the stones were kept, um, if your handle was removable, it meant that nobody else could use your stone when you <laughs> weren't there. What was the other reason? Well, the other reason uh, is that um, by the end of the 19th century, it was uh, thought to be a good idea to have a curling stone with two different surfaces, one more polished than the other and of a different configuration so that they would answer to the different sorts of ice which you got. And the handles there were fixed onto a bolt that went up uh, that went up a hole that was drilled in the centre of the stone and screwed on so that you had, in effect, two pairs of curling stones in one. Perhaps a good Scottish thrifty solution to a problem. And what about the modern equivalent of the handle then? Well, just as modern curling stones have achieved sort of magnificent uniformity, um, 
so have the handles. This is a modern plastic handle. Uh, the handle and the distinguishing feature of one ring stones, in this case red as opposed to say yellow or black or white or green or blue, um, it, it has become one piece. Uh, and this one's a modern cast plastic one. No charm mm. whatsoever. Well, they used <laughs> roughly that sort of handle in the Olympic Games this year. It, it, I suppose in a hundred years it will have lots of charm. <laughs> Now, on to the medals, the, the actual, um, did you say they were trophies or no? I can't remember. These are trophies, right, okay, okay. generally speaking. Right. Oh, yeah. So from the handles to the trophies, the actual spoils of the, uh, the game. Yes, well, here we have a small selection um, of medals. The medal was the trophy. You played for the medal, just as uh, one does or did in golf. Um, the winner or the winning rink held the medal for a year and then it was played for again. And you can see that from a very simple form like this one here from Newkirk of 1823, um, a simple silver uh, plate, um, by the 1850s one had achieved um, something of real magnificence. This is a beautiful bit of silversmithing again. Two brooms, which were used to sweep the ice, set on the face of the medal, and four miniature silver curling stones uh, set on the surface. A really magnificent medal. Many of them were embellished with engravings of curling scenes. This one I like particularly. It shows on the left-hand side um, a farmer, a peasant, you can tell that from his dress, and you can see a laird or a landlord on the other side, he's wearing a silk hat and a frock coat. But they're on the ice, and the great thing about curling was the egalitarianism of it. Everyone on the ice was equal, and that is proclaimed in that ribbon above their heads which reads, we are brethren all. That dates from, uh, that dates from 1862 and is from the Falkirk area. What about this one here, this one? That's a very curious one. Um, that was one of a set of plaques that were given to Scottish curlers by the first official Swedish curling team to come to Scotland in 1923, and that one happens to have been given to the then Secretary of the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. They curled in plus fours. And even small villages would put an awful lot into their little trophy. Indeed they would. Uh, this one, for instance, here, which shows a, a curler curling wearing his silk hat, his tile hat, um, comes from a small estate in Dumfriesshire called Blackwood, Blackwood Barony. Um, this one um, is from Ochenlech, the village which feared to the estate of James Boswell, the famous biographer, um, and it's got a lovely bit of... Uh, poetry, it's got a curling scene, it's got a lovely bit of poetry below, um, by his son Sir Alexander Boswell, when snow lies white in ilka now, the ice stain and the gid broom cow can warm us like a bleasin' low, fair for the ice and curling. <laughs> Very appropriate. We, we've talked a lot about the curling stones themselves and the trophies, but the brushes, what part do they play? Well, brushing was very important. In, on outdoor ice, there's all sorts of bits of snow and twigs and uh, frozen bird excrement on the ice which have to be removed, and brushing did that. But it was discovered very early on that by really brushing hard in front of a stone, you could make it go further. And because all curling stones are rotated when they're delivered, and the rotation causes them to deviate from the straight line either to the left or to the right, sweeping can make that happen later in the course of the stone and therefore affect the ultimate uh, destination of the stone. So sweeping is an integral part of the game and it's the really hard work. It's comparatively little work to throw a 44 pound stone, uh, but to sweep for two and a half hours is really hard work. Mm. And was there anything special about the construction of these things? Well, they varied. Um, the, the original form of uh, broom was just a bunch of broom green from the broom tree or the broom bush. Uh, then what we call in this bit of the world a bism, a 
switch, I, I don't know what you call it in English, um, was the was the normal thing, and that prevailed in North America until comparatively recently. But from the middle of the nineteenth century in Central Asia, they began using horsehair brushes, and that is now the sort of standard which is used. Well, you've got a fantastic collection here. There are always gaps. Is there anything that you're